So I just want to destroy any underlying thought that the cost of war is a necessary evil, that war is somehow good for the economy. Uh, can you tell us why the Great War, why all war is bad for prosperity? Well, I think that that's that that's uh, there's this myth that uh, that governments and some uh, uh, some uh, uh, academics who and, and writers who are uh, either misunderstand or purposefully want to spin uh, things in a different way. There's this myth that wars uh, are helpful to the economy, as you suggest. But in fact, how how can they be since they are a destructive uh, a destructive enterprise. I mean, one one of the one of the characteristics of war is that <clears throat> all your effort uh, these days goes into making bombs, which are designed to not only to destroy themselves, but to destroy uh, things around them. So it's it's you might say it's the it's the remotest kind of activity from a productive activity. So all this uh, non-productive activity. Uh, which will not lead to somebody consuming uh, the food that you grow or the the uh, clothing that you make or whatever uh, the product is. Uh, it is a, it is essentially non-productive. So there's no possible way that uh, that a war could uh, a war could uh, make uh, a better world in that sense, in the sense of of uh, more productivity, uh, more goods for people. Uh, allowing people, especially at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum, to to have access to uh, goods and services and whatnot. No possible way. So war, though, is not necessarily bad for everyone, just as inflation is not bad for everyone equally. Who benefits from the war and the inflation? Well, uh, in uh, in inflation, in, in those are uh, related questions, but they're, they're two different questions. In inflation, uh, it is true that people who are uh, who are uh, say deeply in debt um, uh, benefit from inflation because uh, they can pay back their debts with uh, with uh, money that's worth less, and uh, and yet the debt is the same. Uh, so, with a hyperinflation, if somebody owed uh, in Germany in 1919 20 million uh, marks. Uh, <clears throat> by 1923, they could have paid that off by working a morning, uh, so uh, and just paying off the debt. So uh, that is true. Debtors uh, profit there. People who can somehow uh, have access to foreign money or have uh, reserves of gold and so forth, uh, and so uh, and and then of course the governments profit from the inflation because they're the ones moving the value from from. Uh, you know the the public's wallets to uh, into their treasury. So those people do. In wartime, a lot of people profit. Uh, of course, the all the uh, the companies usually uh, semi-public or tied to the government in some way or contracted to the government. These com- companies make uh, vast sums of money. The, the famous arms merchants, uh, as uh, as they they used to call them in the 30s, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the state profits, uh, and as uh, a great American intellectual uh, uh, put it, a war is the health of the state. I mean, the state profits enormously by this, uh, mm-hmm. by the whole uh, process of getting more money, of seeming more important, being at the center of all this kind of uh, sacred activity of uh, of warfare. And so, uh, you're exactly right. There are, there are plenty of uh, Plenty of entities and uh, and uh, uh, groups and uh, individuals who profit by uh, war and inflation. So at the same time that war calls on the public at large to be patriotic and moral and give up their individualism to the country, it creates a breed of sort of crony capitalists that solely relies on the state to confiscate all their property for their own personal profits. Exactly, Zoe, and it has done that for for all these years. Uh, what, wh- as you just put it, you can find exactly that description in, uh, in a number of letters from George Washington, who uh, condemns, uh, condemns uh, what he calls stock jobbers and people uh, kind of uh, working on that. And by the way, the, revolution, the American Revolutionary War was a period of enormous inflation, 
because they too relied on this uh, on inflationary financing. Mm. Um, so yeah, that's uh, this is a pattern that uh, that is uh, very much a part and parcel of the whole thing. And now with that, well, after the World War, after the First World War, and during the Great Depression, we saw the beginnings of the Keynesian Revolution, and uh, John Maynard Keynes sort of challenged the proposition that a market economy could heal itself. What what did his revolution bring about? Well, uh, Keynes, uh, uh, in this regard, um, hoped to use inflation as a tool of of, of governmental uh, finance, and uh, his his idea was that if you if you make easy money, if you make uh, money easy to get and credit easy to get, then then there will always be some some a little bit more business, a little bit more, uh, a few more jobs uh, available and so forth and so on, so that uh, if you can hit the balance, he thought, between uh, inflating the currency at a kind of controlled rate and and then, and so, uh, and keeping people in sort of jobs in, in, in what economists call the margin of the economy, these marginal enterprises that probably would make it if, if money weren't easy. Uh, so if you keep that that kind of process going, then there will always be low unemployment, <clears throat> and uh, and basically the government can just kind of manage it. Of course, this requires a whole sort of uh, technocratic elite of uh, econ- economics and finance people to to tweak the system constantly uh, in order to do this, and it also involves continual inflation. Uh, uh, for the most part, you're always inflating. So that means, since uh, as as Austrians view this, inflation is theft by the on the part of the government. Then essentially, the you are uh, you're there's a continual kind of injustice happening. In other words, this person works uh, hard for her property, and uh, the government is stealing that property away without telling anybody by means of inflation. So. Um, so that's the that's the idea, and those are the flaws of that that whole Keynesian idea related to inflation. So he sort of turned inflation into a science. Yeah, I think so, or tried to. Uh, uh, that was the idea. Uh, a little later on in the 1950s, an Australian economist uh, named Phillips uh, made more of a science of it and produced the famous Phillips curve, in which uh, he showed that. That all things being equal, that really, er, that really, uh, a, a continual inflation really meant uh, a low uh, rate of unemployment. Uh, and of course, the problem was that this was disproved in the 19, uh, early 1970s uh, in the period of stagflation. Right. Well, let's talk about stagflation when we come back from this break. Um, so we'll have our final segment of today's Radio Free Market with Dr. Hansuli. Hello, and welcome back to Radio Free Market. I'm your guest host, Zoe Russell. Um, I just wanted to start where we left off. Can you just tell us what happened after World War II? There was um, a decision made by all the world leaders called the Bretton Woods Agreement. What was that? Well, Zoe, Bretton, the Bretton Woods Conference took place in, in 1944, just before the end of the war, and uh, uh, one of the prominent figures and and crucial uh, decision makers was uh, none other than John Maynard Keynes uh, at the conference and uh, it was agreed that uh, after the dislocations of the uh, the war and the uh, depression economies of the 1930s that uh, that there'd be a, a regime of worldwide money management in which uh, essentially um, Everybody related their currencies to everybody else's, uh, and this was all pegged to what was called the reserve currency, and that was the United States dollar. Um, it, of interest, I think, is that at the time one of the one of the leading uh, Austrian commentators, Austrian e- economics commentators, uh, Henry Hazlitt, uh, waged a kind of uh, uh, one-man war against this in. In, uh, in newspaper uh, op-ed pieces and books and so forth and uh, and said, you know, it couldn't work because if, if for no other reason, then eventually uh, 
when the United States decided to inflate its currency, that other uh, uh, that other uh, uh, countries could just simply come in and buy dollars and uh, the cheaper dollars, and then exchange those for uh, gold or silver, and take away uh, the the uh, the gold reserves of the United States, which is exactly what happened in the 1960s. Um, so it was a regime in which <clears throat> there was a there was a sort of remote connection between currencies and metal still a, a kind of notional connection you could swap uh uh dollar bills uh for for some amount of gold but but what happened was that as inflation uh increased at the end of the, things were pretty steady in the early 60s and at the end of the 60s uh what with the costs of the Vietnam war et cetera et cetera the and the and of course the the uh the welfare programs of the Mid '60s, then uh, there was a lot of inflation, and uh, and uh, so as as gold reserves seemed as if they would disappear from America, then President Nixon simply took the United States completely off the gold standard and cut any remaining tie between gold. So that at that point, Bretton Woods was essentially dead, and the current system, which is total. Fiat money or total uh, just created money, notional uh, paper money, uh, took the uh, took center stage, and that's the way it's remained ever since. So, have we had many more bubbles and busts, and more extreme bubbles and busts since that happened? Well, I, we certainly have since the uh, since the fifties uh, and sixties, because the inflation rates uh, since then have uh, in the and if we're just talking about the United States here, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, in the United States, uh, there are many bubbles uh, and and busts. Of course, the one we've just gone through, the bust that we've just uh, gone through, is the uh, is the biggest of those. But uh, you know, we can think of the of the uh, 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 early '80s and the late '80s and the early uh, '90s and so forth. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a kind of continuous sort of bubble uh, policy, and. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, this is the sort of things that Austrian economists have uh, have uh, dined out on for all these years. I mean, they're the ones who who actually uh, have predicted uh, that all these uh, kinds of things would happen. So, uh, kudos to those economists uh, from right. this uh, 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 Austrian uh, influenced historian. Yes, and you're one of them. I want to thank you, Dr. Hunt Tooley, for being with us today. This is Zoe Russell and Radio Free Market. Please visit us on the web at RadioFreeMarket.com, where you can download this and all of our shows for free. And until next week, wherever you are, please stand up for freedom. Thank you for listening. <laughs>